Good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Maximizing SBAR, Blending People, Process, and Technology to Drive Meaningful Change. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce today's event moderator, Leanne Myers of PerfectServe. Leanne, please begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dean, for covering the housekeeping items. I'm Leanne Myers, and I'm the Chief Clinical Officer here at PerfectServe. First of all, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. I know how busy your schedules can be, and we promise that this webinar will be time well spent. Before we kick things off, I want to give you a little background on today's webinar. Here at PerfectServe, we provide solutions that can help you drive meaningful improvement in your care delivery processes. With a single unified communications platform that connects clinicians in any care setting across the continuum, inside and outside of your organization. We provide clinicians a more efficient and reliable way to connect with each other. But we also know that the blending of technology, people, and processes is what truly drives change. And we are pleased to have Don, Doug Bonacom, the originator of the Structured and Standardized Healthcare Communications Technique, known as SBAR. Before we dive in, we wanted to ask you, the people living and working in healthcare every day, what your biggest communication challenges are. And then during the Q&A portion of today's event, we'll work to address them with you. To type in your answers, look for the box on the right of your screen that Dean mentioned that says Q&A. You can enter your responses in there now and throughout the webinar. We'll give you a moment or two. And great, we'll see those start to come in and we'll address those at the end with our questions and answers. Also, please don't hesitate to submit any questions that you may have throughout the webinar and we will answer those at, at the end of the call. It is my pleasure today to introduce Doug Bonacom as our guest expert on today's webinar. Doug is Vice President, Quality, Safety, and Resource Management for Kaiser Permanente. He has been with the organization since 1994. In addition to his role with Kaiser Permanente, Doug serves on the Board of Directors for the National Patient Safety Foundation as faculty for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, Patient Safety Executive Program, and as an advisor to ECRI's Patient Safety Office Program. In 2013, he was named one of the 50 experts leading the field of patient safety by Becker's Hospital Review. Doug, thank you so much for joining us today to provide this very important educational webinar, and I'm gonna turn things over to you. Um, thanks, Leanne, and let's go to the outline of today's discussion. Um, here's what we're gonna get accomplished in the next 55 minutes or so. We'll start off with a few polling questions to get to know each other. Um, setting some context on the history of SBAR, sort of where it originated and um, what was going on at the time. We'll review the model in detail and we'll have a couple of different exercises to go through to make sure that it sticks. Talk a little bit about the common challenges that are faced when trying to implement a tool like SBAR and what happens when it doesn't work. What's the sort of the, the solution to that? And at the end, we'll leave you with some examples of tools and templates that you might be able to use in your organizations as you think about sort of hardwiring this practice um, going forward. So we'll move into the polling questions. We have three polling questions to kick things off and give us a chance to get to know each other a little better. We'll take one at a time, and as I'm reading the question, I'll ask you to lock in your answer, and then we'll take a look at the results before going to the next question. So let's start with number one. Um, and again, you're gonna be answering true or false to this and we'll see the results here in a, in a moment. So SBAR is a communication tool that originated in the military and subsequently came to healthcare in the early part of the last decade. Is that true or is that false? Please lock in your answer and I'll say that there are no trick questions necessarily, although this might be one of them. Okay, the poll has ended and we're just tallying the response and 92% of you said that is true. 8% um, said that's false. So congratulations to the 8%. Um, uh, basically, I would say this about that. My experience in the submarine force shaped SBAR, um, but it was actually originated here um, during some training in labor and delivery at Kaiser Permanente. And I'll tell you about that a little bit later. So that first statement is actually not true as written. Um, and again, we'll talk more about this as we go through this journey together. Let's go to the next question. SBAR stands for, is it situation, background, assessment, and recommendation? Status, background, assessment, and response? 
situation, briefing, assessment, and reaction? Or is it status, background, action, and reaction? Thank you for locking in your answers. We're just going to be tallying your responses here in a second, and we'll see sort of how that distribution came out. All right. <laughs> Fantastic. So 99% or 100% that it is uh, situation, background, assessment, and recommendation, and that is the correct answer. I'll say um, when you're given an SBAR, you are trying to get a reaction or a response. So there is some element of those uh, B, C, and D which are true, but it's really the recommendation is where you are leading from. And in question number, or answer number C, it talks about briefing. I'm going to label SBAR as a type of situational briefing, but it is fundamentally different than the type of briefing you might do before a procedure or at the start of the day or a debriefing that you might do after a procedure at the end of the day. It's a situational type of briefing. So A is the correct answer. And then just one more uh, polling question. So as I'm reading this, you'll be able to, um, to open up and lock in your answers. While used for a variety of purposes and a number of different situations today, the original intent of SBAR was A, to conduct pre-procedural briefings, B, to facilitate change of shift report, C, to get action needed to address a patient condition, or D, to provide patients and families with a tool they could use to communicate to us better, A, B, C, or D. All right, uh, about 8% thought A, 18% B, and the rest C. C is the, is the correct answer. And I would say that um, as originally intended, that's sort of where we were focused. And yet over time, I think uh, people have used SBAR um, appropriately in a number of different scenarios and in situations. And I would say it's being used um, for pre-procedural briefings at sometimes. It's being used to facilitate change of shift report in some organizations, clearly to get um, action needed to address a patient condition. And more recently, as we learn more and more about patient and family-centered care, there's organizations that are um, trying to figure out how to teach their patients and family members to use SBAR um, and for our providers to listen and respond to what their concerns are. So I would say the best answer is C, and over time, all of them um, are having applications of SBAR use. So thank you for that. We're going to take a look now just at some context setting, because I think um, it's important to sort of talk about what, what it does take to create safe, reliable care. And this is just a model that we use here at Kaiser Permanente to talk about our core value of patient and family-centered care. Um, really trying to engage patients at every level in the organization, whether that's at the direct care level, whether it's around organizational design and governance, even policy making, um, always trying to keep the patient and family first and foremost in everything that we do. Around that is sort of this notion of continuous process improvement. And in the world of safety, I would say a lot of it around hazard identification, prioritization, and mitigation all on a foundation of leadership, and by that I mean leadership at each level in the organization. So this is not like pointing up the organization to say if only they would do this or they would do that. It's really leadership at the front line, the middle management, and the executive level. And they may have different accountabilities, but it takes all of them acting as leaders to create safe, reliable care. The three points that we talk about sort of in our triangle are technical and cognitive competence, and we don't want to diminish the importance of that. As we learn more and more about the notion of system safety and systems engineer, we also want to say, and it takes each and every individual to be an expert themselves, and that's an important part that other high reliability organizations focus on. The notion of standard work, so standardizing um, everything that can be and nothing more, um, and really trying to get a, a, a set way of doing business in our workflows in a way that we can orient new people um, and train them in sort of the way that we do business and gives us a platform actually to, con to construct performance improvement. And then in the lower left, the piece around teamwork and communication, and that's where I think SBAR clearly um, sits. And uh, on the next slide, we're going to see it's just one of the many communication tools that we're teaching here, um, and, and it could be the most critical one. So here's sort of the portfolio of 
communication skills that, um, again, would look very similar whether you were, uh, um, you know, on a submarine with the most part, uh, with the exception of one or two, or whether you're in a healthcare organization or whether you're in commercial aviation. So what are the sort of basic communication skills that all high reliability organizations embrace? And clearly one um, that we spent a lot of time in this organization around is briefing. So that's really a two or more way uh, communication of concise and relevant information that can be at the beginning of a procedure or it could be at the beginning of a day in the form of a huddle. SBAR, I would say, is a more structured method. It's a type of situational brief, and it's really to communicate critical information and really more importantly, to get action in a specific time frame. Uh, we're going to see where assertion fits in later in the, in the discussion, but assertion may be something that's required after SBAR fails, and SBAR will fail from time to time, but that doesn't mean that we give up in the communication if it's in the best interest of the patient and the family. Um, readbacks and teachbacks are very similar. By a readback, I mean basically one clinician to another, um, summarizing what they heard in a way that makes sure both are on the same page, with a teachback being more between clinician and patient or family. So before I let you, you know, go home today, just so I didn't miss anything, tell me in your own words what your condition is, what you're going to do next, and why that's so important. That would be the utilization of that concept of ask me three and asking the patient or the family member to teach back to us. And the last two, um, critically important, I would say, in all high reliability organizations are call outs, which is just the passing of information that one party knows um, for the benefit of others and debriefing, which we're trying to institutionalize basically at the end of every significant procedure that we do or at the end of a day for sort of our primary care environment. What did we learn that went well and what do we want to do differently tomorrow? So our focus for the next 50 minutes or so are going to be specifically around SBAR, that structured communication to get action in a timely way. Going back to the origins of SBAR, um, Shortly after I had begun working in the area of patient safety at Kaiser Permanente, a hospitalist approached me, and he told me a story about reviewing some charts outside of a patient's room. It was not his patient. He just happened to be outside in the hall. And he um, says it, it appeared like the RN called an intern, and he heard her say words like, the patient's family really wants you to come and see him. Um, and my friend, the hospitalist, said it appeared that the intern stated that he could come, but he couldn't come right then. He was a bit busy. So some time went on, and my colleague continued to sort of look at his charts. And in this time, 15 minutes has passed, and a family member comes out to get the RN. Um, and as a result, she can see that the RN is pretty upset. The RN um, calls the intern and says, um, you know, I, I need you to come. The family's upset. They want you to see him. And it looks like the intern says something like, hey, I told you I'm coming, but I just can't come right now. And he basically hangs up the phone on her. Um, Ten minutes later, the family comes out again, this time, the second time, extremely agitated and demands to see a doctor, any doctor. Um, the RN approached my friend, and basically he went in to find the patient in full code. Um, that was sort of a moving story for me. I just couldn't imagine an environment where, you know, someone needed help so badly and there was an inability between, you know, professionals with the best intentions of mind to get on the same page and do the right thing. And when they de did the debrief, the intern, you know, said something like, hey, the RN didn't tell me how sick the patient really was. If she had communicated more clearly, I would have come. And the RN, of course, saw it differently. You know, I couldn't have been much clearer. I needed him, and I needed him then, and I don't know what his problem was. And, of course, the family member sort of witnessing all of this saw things even differently than that. That sort of touched me early about sort of the, the scope of the communication challenge we often face in healthcare, again, with the best of intentions and, um, and really a high level of professionalism, but a lack of sort of structure on how we can communicate and get help when we need it. Shortly later, um, I would say this was with a colleague of mine, Dr. Michael Leonard, who was at Kaiser Permanente at the time, and Suzanne Graham, who was our executive director for patient safety. We were providing some basic team training to a group in labor and delivery. And during the course of the conversation, the nurses were expressing frustration about sort of their voice not being heard. 
and the doctors were expressing frustration around not exactly knowing what was wanted and why. Um, Michael asked the question, something like, what are the pebbles in your shoe? What are the things that really disappoint you and sort of um, rob you of joy and meaning and work? And the doctors would say something like, hey, I just want the headlines. What's the issue and what needs to be done? And the RNs would say, well, I've been trained to describe sort of narratively and I dare not diagnose. Um, I remember one MD saying, you know, if they're going to wake me up in the, in the middle of the night, it better be, you know, darn good. And then the RNs coming back and saying, you know, the last time we woke someone up or he yelled at me. So again, sort of this basic group that wanted to do the right thing and yet didn't have a communication pathway to, to move forward. I sensed um, that the communication challenge that the RNs were facing was not that different than what I faced um, in the Navy when I had to call my captain in the middle of the night with a particular problem. So. Imagine, if you will, it's the mid to late 1980s. We're in the North Atlantic Ocean on the USS George Washington Carver. Um, it's the heart of the Cold War, and collectively, we're hundreds of feet below the ocean surface on what was called a strategic deterrent patrol. Um, I'm the officer of the deck. I am 24 years old, and I've got charge of the entire nuclear power plant and all of the weapons and all of the crew as my captain is soundly sleeping at night. Um, and the scenario is that sonar has reported a new contact, and they would say, sonar off the deck, we have a new contact designated Sierra 17. Sierra 17 is classified as a submerged contact, and it appears to be closing in range. Um, it's 2 a.m., and I'm in charge, and now I have to figure out what I'm supposed to do with this, um, what seems like it could be a dire situation. So. What I would do is I'd sort of gather my thoughts and the conversation might look something like this. Captain, um, Ensign Bonicum, I'm sorry to wake, wake you, sir. I have a new contact, Sierra 17, that Sonar has been tracking for about 30 minutes. We picked him up at 2,000, I'm sorry, we picked him up at 20,000 yards, but now his estimated range is about 10,000 yards and he's closing. I have tried changing speed to open up the range from Sierra 17, but I've not been able to shake him. I fear we may have been counter-detected. Um, I am going to change depth, and I'm going to rig the ship for ultra-quiet, and I will call you in 20 minutes with an update. Do you have any questions for me? And that is how um, I learned to communicate difficult information in the middle of the night acting as sort of an owner of the problem, but letting someone in this case know what the issue was, um, how I had assessed it. And I wasn't making a recommendation at the time. We were taught not to make recommendations. We were, say, we were taught to make intention statements. So I intend to do X, Y, and Z. And if the captain, the person on the other end of the line, was not happy with our intentions, um, he would give us a different order or he would come out himself at that point and help solve the problem. So I found it very empowering. It was a way to communicate succinct information, state an intention, and to get action if I needed action. I learned sort of in my training that this was a way to gain respect of people higher up in the hierarchy across significant sort of power gradients. It promoted teamwork among the crew, and it clearly helped clarify roles and responsibilities. I, you know, I was in charge, and yet I also had someone I was accountable to who in the end had to make the ultimate decision of what, whether or not my next steps were correct. So that's sort of the framing in the background. Now, as we think about healthcare, just moving to the next slide, um, there's a paper that's been put out recently by the National Patient Safety Foundation called Through the Eyes of the Workforce, and it's about creating joy, meaning, and safer healthcare. And one of the statements in the, in the document, uh, Lucian Leap was a lead uh, author in this paper, says, across the healthcare workforce, ambiguity of roles, wasteful and non-value-added work, lack of teamwork, and an environment of disrespect are robbing people of the experiences that bring joy and meaning into their work lives. Um, I don't think SBAR is the silver bullet for addressing all of the issues outlined in that statement and in that document, but absence of good communication skills like SBAR does fuel the fire of disrespect and I think rob both patients and nurses and physicians and all healthcare providers of joy and meaning in work. 
So let's take a look on the next slide at what the elements of SBAR are. If you sort of thought about my communication back on the submarine, I contacted the captain and very quickly told him I had a sonar contact, Sierra 17. Um, I gave him sort of some outline that I had picked up Sierra 17 at 20,000 yards. He was now 10,000 yards, which means he significantly closed the gap between me and him, which is a bad thing if you're on a strategic deterrent patrol. You don't want someone sort of in your neighborhood. And I concluded that I think we had been counter-detected, which is a really significant issue. At that point, since I'm the one who's empowered and closest to the scene, I told the captain what I intended to do. I intend to change depth, and I intend to rig the ship for ultra-quiet. So no one ever taught me um, this is the S, and this is the B, and this is the A, and this is the R. It's just the pattern in which people spoke was like I just outlined, and it always got good results. And I think what I was able to do when I came to healthcare was to detect a pattern that was not very helpful, a pattern that resulted in the nurse feeling exasperated that he or she wasn't getting help, and the doctor feeling really mad that he didn't get the headlines or she didn't get the headlines, and they didn't know what they were supposed to do next. And that's how sort of SBAR came together. It was trying to say, well, what was that pattern of communication like? It was a situation, it was a background, it was an assessment, it was a recommendation, and then figuring out how we might teach nurses and doctors to use that tool. So let's go to the next slide and we'll walk through a case together. I'm gonna to do this relatively quickly, but you can see sort of how an SBAR might get created um, in the moment. So here's an 85-year-old male, uh, post-operative day number three from uh, hip repair. He has a history of CHF and hypertension and diabetes. He was doing well, eating, working with physical therapy, uh, but more recently now he's short of breath. His respirations look labored. Um, some of his um, vitals, are the respiratory rate is 26. His oxygen sat is down to 93%. His blood pressure is 130 over 65. And um, as the nurse, I hear lung crackles uh, about halfway up the chest. His input and output is about 1,500 milliliters positive over the last 24 hours. And he says he has no chest pain. So that's sort of the situation now in front of the, the nurse. And maybe it is the middle of the night and he or she is thinking, I need to get some action. So the traditional model of communication, um, you know, if the nurse is not trained in SBAR or, or this type of sort of structured communication just doesn't come naturally, might be something like, you know, Dr. Jones, this is Nurse Betty, I'm calling about Mr. Smith, he's short of breath and I'm concerned. And then, you know, the way things that have played out in the past when things don't go very well is um, these two play 20 questions and then ultimately come up with a plan that may or may not be mutually acceptable to both of them, but it's always uncomfortable to both parties. The nurse feeling like I've given enough information and the physician saying, I, I want the headlines, but I need a little bit more than that, and what exactly do you want me to do? And that notion of sort of going back and forth on the phone and ending in sort of a less than satisfactory manner is clearly not always in the best interest of the patient and the family. So how SBAR could bridge this gap, um, you know, it does ensure completeness of information. Um, it allows sort of the person who's gonna communicate to, to get out their key points in a way that makes sense for them, that they can communicate, and in a way that'll be heard well, and make sure that they don't leave out any vital piece of information that'll help the ultimate decision maker what to do. Um, it does set the expectation that flattens the hierarchy. So, you know, as a submariner, I was an ensign and I worked for a captain and there was never a more significant power gradient in any organization I had ever been part of until you also get into um, healthcare and you see a significant sort of power gradient or power differential between often a doctor and a nurse. And yet in the interest of safety, what high reliability organizations are able to do is flatten that hierarchy and they flatten it in a number of ways, including the way that people communicate to each other. So in this case, the nurse is not gonna make a diagnosis on this patient because it's not his or her job to diagnose, but they are close to it. They have a professional opinion. They make an assessment and they can make a recommendation. 
and it's very empowering. We still know sort of who ultimately is in charge, but all of a sudden the hierarchy is flattened, and now it's not sort of um, uh, who is right, it's what is right, and it, a tool has helped sort of the nurse through that struggle. Um, and the last part is that that standardization makes communication less random or person dependent. So for some people, this type of communication is going to be very easy for them to do, and others it's a struggle. But the structure allows everyone to come up to a basic level of competency that works for them and for their patients. So here's how this might play out. The nurse is thinking, hmm, you know, I don't like what I'm seeing here. And he or she starts to problem solve. They do that by looking at all of the data and the information, uh, when the patient was admitted, you know, what their operation was, where they post-operative, how they were doing, and now more recently, <clears throat> what they're seeing that's given them concern. And they're now going to try to communicate and collaborate in a way that's going to solve the problem in a timely fashion. So the assessment begins with something like, hmm, I don't know or like what I'm seeing and what am I seeing? And that notion of the nurse often having a, um, a sense of intuition early on that things just don't seem right, but that not really being often sort of um, what the physician needs to hear. He or she to be a better partner in the process is going to hear a little bit more. So the nurse is asking him or herself, well, what exactly am I seeing? And this is where she can go to the, or he can go to the background. So, well, I'm seeing a respiratory rate of 26, which is, you know, not great, and an oxygen sat of 93, which is not great. I'm concerned about both of those. The blood pressure of 130 over 60, and as I'm listening to the lungs, there's crackles about halfway up. And input and output is positive 1,500 over the past 24 hours. This is all relevant background that has led me to believe uh, perhaps this patient is in fluid overload. And now, going forward, I need to figure out how to communicate to the doctor and how to get the action that I want. So it might play something like this. And I would say when you do an SBAR and it's on the phone, um, sometimes the doctor and the nurse might not always know each other, um, which should begin with an introduction. So Dr. You know, Smith or Dr. Jones, this is Nurse Betty. So always sort of a, um, a greeting before the situation actually starts to unfold. I'm calling about Mr. Smith. Uh, you might even say he's, you know, post-operative day uh, three. He's in room 323. He's short of breath, and his breathing looks labored to me. That's, um, that short of breath part and the breathing looks labored is enough of a situation to get the doctor to want to listen to the rest of the story. And now the doctor's thinking, okay, what other background information do I need ultimately to help make this assessment with the nurse who's calling me? So the nurse has said he's post-operative day three from a hip replacement. He has a history of hypertension and CHF. He was doing really well until today. He was eating and working with PT, but now his respiratory rate is 26, oxygen 93%, lungs crackled, and inos positive uh, 1.5 liters or 1,500 milliliters. That is great amount of information now for the doctor to start, again, thinking as the nurse continues with what her assessment is. So, again, she's not diagnosing or he's not diagnosing. He or she is just saying, I've got a lot of professional experience. I see the situation. I'm considering the background, and I think he might be fluid overloaded. And here's where the, the, the whammy comes in. Um, she's not going to state an intention like we would have done in the submarine force. She's going to state or he's going to state a recommendation that's going to get the action that he or she thinks is appropriate. So in this case, I'd like to HEP lock his IV and get you to evaluate him as soon as possible. So an action with some sort of time boundary around it. Um, we're going to assume for now that that was a sufficient SBAR for the physician to provide a response that was satisfactory to the nurse. In a little while, we'll look at, well, what if that doesn't happen? What does the nurse do next? But for now, that was a well-structured SBAR that empowered the nurse, it flattened the hierarchy, it gave the right information, and um, the physician will probably take this for action and now give the nurse an order to, to proceed with the HEP lock and make some sort of negotiation with her on when he can come to the bedside. We're going to take a look now um, at both good and bad SBARs, and we use this because if you're thinking about um, 
rolling SBAR out in your organization or maybe you, you did and it's fallen a little flat, to be able to show people what it looks like when it's really, really bad and what it looks like when it's really, really good um, and allow them to sort of comment on both of them is an important way to teach it and to get people to buy into the power of it. So let's start with the, uh, the first one. Hi, doctor. Uh, this is about Mrs. Lakewood. Post-op surgery a couple of days ago. She's, uh, her family's giving me a lot of trouble. They're real high maintenance. I've been talking to them quite a bit. Anyway, something's going on. Maybe it's not important. Lab work came back okay. Uh, we did an IV on her because, uh, but it didn't seem to help the urine output. Uh, the oxygen saturation is okay when she puts it on, which is about half the time. Anyway, the incision is beginning to bug her, and she's using a lot of morphine, which makes it hard to um, assess what's really going on. I don't know. What do you think we ought to do? All right. So, um, you know, an example of maybe what we wouldn't want to see after spending an hour or so on the phone talking about SBAR, and yet time and time again um, we find that um, sometimes our colleagues do communicate each other in that fashion, and it's very frustrating. We went back to that notion of robbing people of joy and meaning of work. You can see where that's not going to get the result that you want, and it's going to be disappointing not only to the nurse and the physician ultimately, but to the patient and the family. So let's take a look at one that's done a little bit better. Dr. Cooper. Yes, this is about Mrs. Lakewood. I'm concerned that she's having difficulty breathing and her uh, blood pressure's dropping. Yes, sir. And um, she's a 65-year-old woman, two days post-op. She has medical problems of obesity, uh, cardiac disease, and uh, diabetes. And uh, yes. Well, I'm concerned that right now she may be actually going into a cardiac, uh, some cardiac event. Yes, sir. I need you now. Are you on your way? Good. Great. So clearly, you know, maybe you felt like the second one wasn't perfect. And um, if you do use such a video when you're training other people, you might be able to say, you know, on a scale of one to ten, how'd you think that one was? And um, and what could he have done to even improve it even more? But to compare and contrast those two, um, it's clear that this person has gotten some SBAR type training. Um, they've been able to sort of organize their thoughts. And my guess is that they're very successful in getting sort of the actions that they feel like they need for their patients. They feel like the hierarchy is flattened um, and that they've got a collaborative work environment with their physician colleagues. And on the other end of that, you know, when the physician does pick up the phone and they hear that nurse's um, voice, um, it's probably done again in the spirit of collaboration and participation in patient care and really wanting to be the best possible partner for this nurse um, to take care of their patient. So um, SBAR is the type of training that can, and I have seen it, change that sort of first dialogue, again, very well-intentioned and, um, and professional person, but just with poor communication skills and really turn it into something that gets a uh, timely and effective response from their physician partners. All right. We are going to ask, in this case, um, you all to read this scenario here. Let me just sort of go through it. Um, you've had a number of communication challenges in your organization where important information was not shared between two or more parties to get the action that the situation required. In some cases, relationships were hurt, but in other cases, the outcomes were much worse. So if your organization is like my organization, we've had a history of these types of things. Um, one such event might have happened recently, and we'll just say for the purposes of this scenario, it happened just yesterday, that you and your boss were notified about late last night. Uh, upon talking to those involved in the previous cases and studying the organization's culture, you've identified several barriers to effective communication, including the senders of the information not feeling empowered, the receivers of the information not being helpful or respectful, and the absence of a framework or a model to facilitate communication. 
Um, you have also observed that communication-related education and training is lacking. Uh, like we talk about communication problems all the time, but we don't have specific tactics and tools in place to address the challenges we all know about. So right after this webinar, the scenario plays out. You meet your boss in an elevator and decide to give her an SBAR about the need to implement SBAR. Um, you don't need to seal the deal, but you do need to get her interested in moving forward. And I've asked Leanne to sort of reflect on the training that we've had here today and this scenario and have her give an SBAR out to everyone on what it might look like if she met her boss um, you know, in or near an elevator and had to convince the boss that the next thing to do was to get on board with SBAR and to begin to try to spread this throughout her organization. So Leanne, what might an SBAR sound like here? Yeah, and I had the opportunity to reflect on this. Um, Doug sent me the question last week as we were getting prepared, and as I thought about this, I would respond, um, Nancy, as you know, we've had a number of communication failures in our organization which have been leading to disappointing outcomes. What we heard about last night was just one example of this. I attended a WebEx this morning about a communication tool called SBAR that high reliability organizations across the world are using as a structured method to communicate important information in a succinct manner for the purpose of getting action. SBAR stands for Situation, Background, Assessment, and Recommendation. Had an SBAR been given in the case we heard about last night, I think the outcome could have been avoided. And furthermore, looking back over the cases involving breakdowns in communication, my assessment is that there is a fundamental lack of empowerment, respect, and support for good communication. Nothing will change us in, unless we begin to support it. I want your support in introducing and testing an SBAR. It's targeted at exactly the communication challenges we are facing. I will get it on your calendar within the next few days to present my proposal. I know you will be pleased. Thanks for that, Leanne. Um, so that was terrific. And I think really, again, um, as you outlined it, quickly you touched on the situation, which is you know we've had a number of communication failures and um, including the one just last night. So that is the, that's the situation. The background was, you know, that you'd been exposed to this tool or technique called SBAR and that it was a, uh, an opportunity to pre present information in a succinct manner for the purpose of getting action. And you even told her what SBAR quickly stood for. Then you made sort of your assessment. So, you know, had an SBAR been given last night, I think the outcome would have been avoided. And as I look back over our other data, you know, I think a tool like this is what's needed to close the gap. Um, the recommendation then proceeded with, you know, I want your support in testing this. So it's not going to be on day one, you know, we're not doing it on day two, everyone is, but let's test this. And I'm going to come up with a plan and I intend on presenting it to you in a few days and I'm going to get on your calendar. So that was sort of a recommendation and an intention statement, which left it very clearly in her boss's lap about sort of where Leanne stood on this, what she was thinking, and I think whetted her appetite enough that um, she's going to make time in her calendar in a couple of days to try to solve not just the problem that happened last night, but the communication challenges that this organization is facing. So, Leanne, I think that was a great SBAR. Um, you know, in, if, you, if the folks on the phone are, are trying to roll SBAR out again in your organization, you can create scenarios like this and allow people to uh, write out an SBAR and then practice it with each other and allow each other to give feedback. Um, so I think that was spot on. And what I was listening for was sort of the situation, the background, the assessment, and the recommendation, although Leanne never said, you know, this is the situation, this is the background, my assessment is, and here's the recommendation. It just sort of flowed naturally. So that's the intent with using a tool like SBAR. Now, the challenges that, you know, we faced in my organization, and I know uh, others have faced just in talking to uh, folks in other organizations, is how do you get buy-in? Um, uh, where the assessment and the recommendation goes and sort of the flow of things, and then what goes where in terms of order. I would say uh, buy-in typically can be, um, can be gotten through an analysis of your close calls, your actual events, and trying to really understand not that it was just the communication problem, which is often where we stop, 
but what about the communication was problematic and why would structured communication and empowerment and flattening the hierarchy be part of the solution to the problem? So my thought there would be, um, you know, as you're trying to create buy-in, use stories, use data. Um, you may also want to reference what other, again, high reliability organizations use. And again, you will not find, as far as I know, an S, a B, an A, and the R in commercial aviation or in nuclear power plant operations or in uh, military operations, but you're going to find they structure their language and they're able to flatten hierarchy and get action when action is needed, and that's exactly what's needed in healthcare. So that's one of the ways to try to create uh, buy-in. The assessment and recommendation part, I think, is the part that we struggled with the most, and we've been working at this now for 10 years, and that was that the, um, the nurses in particular still felt like the assessment was a nursing assessment, which tends to be um, very sort of descriptive and narrative and long and gives a lot of important data and information, but doesn't really say, as a professional, here's what I think is going on, right? If you went back to that submarine story I gave you, I said, Captain, I think we've been counter-detected. Those words um, would cause him to jump out of bed. It would be my assessment of the situation, and it would uh, really set me up for success on the next piece, which is the recommendation. Um, and where I think sometimes we have challenges in healthcare with the recommendation is, again, colleagues thinking, well, I'm not a doctor, therefore I don't make a diagnosis. And I would say, you're not making a diagnosis. You're giving an assessment and you're prompting action, uh, requesting an order, requesting assistance in a way that's going to move the problem um, forward. So the assessment and the recommendation, I think, are the things to really focus on the most when you're rolling this out and making sure that people feel like it's not a assessment as we've typically defined it, but what do you think is going on and what action do you want to see by when? And then the last, what goes where? You know, um, I like acronyms and I can remember sort of uh, things when they're set up like SBAR and it's got a nice little ring to it. But in the end, I think it's more important that you get the situation, the background, and the assessment and the recommendation and don't fret as much about whether, you know, the background came before the situation. If you get the vital elements and you're able to communicate it in a succinct way, um, that's more important. And then over time, people become more comfortable with the tool and it will flow in the SBAR format. But I think of those three challenges I listed right there, that's probably the least one to worry about in the beginning. So what I have sort of recognized is that some people do this naturally and for others it's going to take practice. Um, and that as an organization, you shouldn't think just by maybe putting a policy or some online training module out about SBAR that it's going to happen um, overnight. People, um, you know, all have good gut feelings and they have vague notions of what's going on, but to take that sort of jump to articulate it, again, some need very uh, disciplined sort of structure around their communication, and then others, it's just going to flow naturally. Um, and you're going to have to assume at the start anyway, every way that everyone does need a little support and a little training and education. And I think more importantly, um, a chance to practice it in a safe environment before they're, you know, needing to practice it on uh, an OB whose uh, head is in bronze in the main lobby and you have to call him or her up in the middle of the night. That's just not fair. So, um, to really recognize that uh, everyone could benefit from some structured training and a structured tool like SBAR. Now, we said earlier before um, when we gave some examples, you don't always get what you want, right? Um, and, and in this case, what we're trying to teach our staff to do is to say, you're still accountable for trying at least one more time, and then if that doesn't work, to escalate. Because if we went back to that sort of that core value of patient and family-centered care, you know, what is in the best interest of the patient or the family, just because I gave my SBAR that I gave before and needing the doctor's assistance, if the doctor didn't give me the order that I wanted and wasn't available to come to the bedside in the time frame that I needed, then it's my job one more time to express my concern 
to restate the problem. So not just to go back over the same exact SBAR, but to maybe give maybe one more piece of background information or to reiterate my assessment of the criticality of the situation and propose action. Um, and if that action was, you know, I need you and I need you to come to the bedside within the next 10 minutes, and the physician says that's just not going to happen, that at that point there's got to be an agreed to um, escalation process in the organization where I know where I can go next to get help because hanging up the phone and being disappointed and trying my best with the patient isn't the right answer at that point. So when we teach SBAR, we teach it sort of as we have just gone through on the call today, but we also say if you don't get the action you want, and it's in the best interest of the patient, we have to have an escalation process that all parties understand is in place and that's gonna be utilized when it needs to be utilized. I'm just gonna show you here a couple of different sort of tools that we use. So you've seen the training videos and we show good SBAR and bad SBAR and we ask groups to sort of debrief on it um, and then to also practice one using some script like Leanne did before. We'll look at some pocket cards. So something simple is shown on the next slide as you're introducing SBAR to the organization. So if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, something like this that some people can just, you know, they may forget early on what the S, the B, the A, the R is. You guys, 99% of us on the phone call got that part, but people are going to forget a little bit about that. So what is the situation, the background, the assessment, and the recommendation? And that can just go in someone's pocket card uh, or in their wallet. Next one. Now, this is a tool um, that I like except for one piece of it. This was a tool that we used early on, and it came across my desk, and I said, well, I sort of like the way that this situation is, uh, is labeled and uh, the part about stating your name and your unit to make sure that you've got a little bit of a relationship before you start getting into the problem and the background. But this assessment, to me, seemed too much still like a nursing assessment, more like this is what the blood pressure is, and this is the pulse, and this is the respiration, and this is the temperature, and this is the skin color. And all of a sudden, I see someone on the other end of the line starting to sort of distance themselves from this conversation. The assessment really ought to be, what do you think is going on? So some of that information, like the blood pressure, the pulse, if it's really vital background information, as I think it was in the case that I shared with you, ought to be moved up into the background, but the assessment would be, you're a professional, what's going on? Uh, you may be wrong, uh, but in a culture that we're trying to create around psychological safety, that's okay. I just want to hear what you think is going on. So I like this tool with the exception of the assessment part, and I would redo it to make sure that people understand what should be, what should be there. Next slide. <laughs> there you go. Um, we are using it now, so I, I'm going to be going in front of our board of directors here in about three weeks, um, and there's a number of other presentations that are made. As part of us going in front of the board, we come typically with a short deck of, of uh, PowerPoint, of course, maybe five to ten slides. But we also have to give them um, often an executive summary of what we want. And all of our executive summaries right now are done in SBAR format. So the format you see right here is what we're using that our board members can look at quickly. Um, they're able to sort of scan through that in the time that they have available. They know what the situation, or in this case is, we've modified a little to say what's the desired outcome. They're given sufficient background. Um, an assessment of what we think is going on, and then a recommendation. What do we want from them? Um, and this really helps them with the volume of information that they have to go through to, to get to the place where we can have a collaborative conversation on next steps. So again, SBAR is not just for um, clinical situations. It can be used on things like this kind of communication to a board of directors. Um, I'll talk briefly about this, and then we're going to open it up, I think, to question and answer. Um, what I would say is, in my experience at Kaiser Permanente, as we're trying to roll out anything that's a change from people's current course, that it's important to sort of socialize what the issue is, so the why behind SBAR, before you start to even talk about what it is. Why do we need a tool like it? The standardization part is to get agreement on, you know, the S, the B, the A, and the R, and the tools that are going to be used to roll it out. The demonstration part is to give people an opportunity in a safe environment, just like Leanne and I did on the phone here, to practice and to get a little feedback on their performance before they have to go live. The implementation part is, you know, are you going to start in a unit? Are you going to start in a department? Are you going to start hospital-wide or system-wide? And for me, it's always better to start small, 
to learn from sort of mistakes and successes and then come up with a spread strategy. The observation in the coaching part is where you turn to middle managers and those supervising people and say, you're going to have to get out from behind your desk and off the phone and onto the floor and observe people actually giving and receiving SBAR. And if you really want to make this stick, you're going to have to give some observation and coaching, pat people on the back when it's done right, and encourage them to sort of change what needs to be changed when it's not done correctly. The conversation part is really what the staff need to do with each other. So we train our doctors to um, converse in such a way that the nurse, you know, is maybe going on and on and on, and the doctor might just say, can you please give me an SBAR? Or would you mind restating that in an SBAR? That's a conversation that goes on between colleague and colleague in a way that ultimately helps the doctor but helps the person communicating it. So that piece is critical as well as what the expectations are going to be. And then last but not least, and we don't go to escalation on a tool like SBAR in this context, but when someone either will not or cannot use the tool after it's been socialized and standardized and, and so forth, then you've got to figure out what else needs to be done. And it's typically sort of more of a problem with HR than it is a problem in patient safety. So that's the wrap up here. You, you, uh, you, we all have a need to both personally utilize and encourage others to use SBAR. We've been working on it for a while and we still have a long way to go here. You received an overview on the history and the application of SBAR in today's um, discussion. Um, I think you're ready to begin using SBAR or maybe to make improvements on what you're already doing. And I would say just make a commitment to yourself within the next 24 hours, and it could be that you're going to write an email in an SBAR. It's a very practical way of um, communicating to other colleagues. You might teach your partner or significant other or maybe friend to use SBAR. It might help at home. And last but not least, uh, try to verbalize at least one SBAR, and that's a way for you to start sort of um, – getting more conversant with it and feeling comfortable ultimately teaching others to be as well. Great. Thank you so much, Doug. You really shared a lot of great information with us today, and um, it was a great presentation. I certainly learned a lot, and I'm sure our audience did as well. Um, before we head into answering specific questions, which we actually have many of, if we don't get to them today, we will make sure that they get answered for folks. Um, I wanted to take a moment and circle back to our original question we posed to you at the start of today's webinar, what are the biggest communication challenges you face? And I guess as I watched the responses come in, there were a few themes that came out and it related to transitions and handoff, provider to provider communications, and culture. And Doug, I think you did a really nice job of addressing those. And I think we have some more specific questions around those, but I wanted to see if maybe you wanted to comment on any of those before I hopped into the more specific questions. Um, just in terms of transitions, I think SBAR can be used as a tool um, in transitions of care. Um, I definitely was not created for that purpose, and I would say my organization largely is not using it for that. I think it can help when it's just one practitioner to one practitioner about one patient. If you're turning over a number of different patients, that's sort of a change of shift. I think there's other sort of structured tools that can be more helpful sort of in that type of transition of care. Um, with respect to culture, that's a tricky one. I think culture, again, is created through people's experiences that then drive their beliefs, that then drive their behaviors. So there are some people who think you can think your way into acting and others who think you can act your way into thinking. Uh, I think both, actually, and I would suggest that by acting on a tool like SBAR, you can start to change the culture um, in a sort of an effective and efficient way. So I think that's sort of a both-and strategy there. Provider to provider, I think SBAR can be used, but it's typically, again, I think most effectively used when there is some sort of gradient where one person, you know, has a thought, has an idea, needs action, and the other person ultimately makes the decision. That's sort of the sweet spot of SBAR. Great. Thank you very much. We actually have had a few questions come in, and I'll try to put them all into one question. but. Could you please clarify or comment a little bit about SBAR documentation being described in healthcare as part of the patient's medical record? Yeah, so we um, don't necessarily uh, use SBAR in that fashion. Um, 
you know, I, I sort of feel like having sort of that pocket card and that reference um, for those situational briefings, for that time in the middle of the night or, you know, it doesn't have to be in the middle of the night. It can be during the middle of a shift during the day where you need specific action. And I think your documentation around sort of the patient condition with the relevant background information uh, and what the situation is is more than sufficient, and what you're trying to do now is to take your experience and um, and the training and education you've gotten around SBAR and articulate something briefly. It was not meant to be, again, a tool to document. It was meant to be a tool to communicate based on what you've already documented in the record and what you think to be going on. So um, when we teach it, we teach it just as another communication tool, much like we would a debriefing at the end of a shift or at the end of a procedure. Um, and we don't um, necessarily encourage people to, to document the S, the B, the A, and the R. I think that can, you know, it's one more thing a busy practitioner has to do at a time where their patient is, um, you know, may be in need of critical support. So that would be, you know, my thinking on that. I know other organizations think differently. Great. Thank you. Um, another question that came in, have you seen any unique uses of SBAR given all the new technology that's out there, for example, with email or secure messaging, text messaging? So we, we definitely use um, – uh, SBAR on email here a lot, um, and um, it's not sort of necessarily expected. I do see when people use it, they're usually more successful in communicating and getting what they want out of their communication. Um, and we do have secure messaging to our physicians. I think the next step could be, again, that notion of how do you um, help your patients communicate in a succinct way, both electronically and face-to-face, -face, I think there's some potential for SBAR to be used there. So as a patient or a family member, here, Doc, is what's going you know, on with me right now. Let me share a little bit of background. Here's what I think is wrong with me, and I know my body best. Uh, you know, I could be wrong, but here's what I think. And, um, you know, where it sort of falls short is in the recommendation part because you really don't necessarily want to be recommending tests and orders to your doctor. But the situation, the background, and the assessment, perhaps with, uh, you know, a request for some additional information or for what the doctor's thinking, I think would be a nice way to help our patients better communicate with our physicians. We're not doing that right now here, but I do know others are beginning down that path. Great. Thank you. And we're coming right up on the top of the hour, but there's a couple more questions that I want to put out there, and then we'll wrap up, and we'll work with Doug to get the questions answered that, that we're not. Um, but one question came in and said, I'd be interested in knowing why you think SBAR is not a good tool for handing over the care of a large group of patients. Are there better tools out there? Um, so... Uh, I, I guess I just feel like it, you know, and maybe I'm just stuck on what the original intent was, which was for a situational uh, briefing to get action on sort of an urgent situation. Um, I, I find it maybe a little bit cumbersome to, depending on how many patients, you know, you're handing over from one physician to another or one nurse to another, on whether the, the communication needs to be structured in such a fashion. Um, clearly, the, the oncoming shift or the person who's responsible, um, it would be helpful for them to have some background on what's happened since they last were in contact with the patient. But in terms of, you know, making recommendations on what the next person do, um, I, I think it sort of starts to um, lose its original purpose and, um, and not necessarily what the oncoming person needs to be hearing right now. What they probably need to hear are, you know, of the patients that we've got, what are the critical issues, what's the current status, and if there are plans for them, what are the plans? But then at that point, taking accountability for, you know, coming up with their assessment of what they're going to be doing and what the plan is for the rest of the ship. So I think it can be um, different organizations use different tools on handoff in particular. There's a lot of information of that in the literature. I do think it's a big opportunity in healthcare to shore up some of our problems, but I don't necessarily think SBAR has to be the solution to that. Great. I agree. Um, I have one final question that I think is a good way to wrap it up, and then there's a few other questions that, um, Doug, maybe I can work with you to get answered, but um, this final question is, do you have any suggested resources 
or comments on how high reliable organizations flatten the hierarchy in a really hierarchical type of organization? Uh, that's a great question. And again, for me, the military was, um, you know, as hierarchical or more than I think healthcare is. Um, I do think it comes with expectations. So it would have been clear to everyone on board a submarine that we were all expected to speak up. That would have been clear from the leadership in the organization, and that if we didn't speak up, that would be maybe per perhaps consequential to us, that that was the expectation, and that we were also guaranteed that if we were to speak up, even if we were wrong, that that was going to be safe. You know, not saying something be because of the number of reasons we do in healthcare was not acceptable. Um, so I think it comes from leadership sort of stating that expectation as well, in ha as, well as having people's backs. So when you do speak up, you know, if the response is inappropriate, that um, the person who spoke up is not the person who's getting, you know, um, a, a private visit, but the person who was uh, inappropriate in their response. So that's one thing. I think it starts with leadership. I do think tools like SBAR um, help, and as does briefing and debriefing, so structured communications and establishing expectations. Um, what I've seen really flat in the hierarchy is the use of debriefing. So at the end of the procedure or at the end of the day, let's talk about what went well and what we could, what we could do differently the next time. And it really creates an environment that we're all in this together and that everyone's voice is important. Again, I think you need to train the leaders and the middle managers on how to facilitate that correctly, but that begins to flatten the hierarchy as well. And in the end, you still have to be sure that everyone knows that there is sort of a captain of the ship or a leader who's ultimately accountable, but that the decisions are going to be made in a more collaborative um, and collegial way than they have in the past. And to reward and recognize that and then to address the people who are being disruptive, which I think are you know, a few in healthcare, each organization knows who those people are, and I think those are the people that need to be uh, uh, addressed in a very um, clear and succinct way. Great. Thank you, Doug, and I think that was a great way to wrap things up for today. Um, if we didn't get to folks' questions, we will get those answered and put those out. Um, my email address is out there so we can make sure that you can submit any other questions you may have. Also, many of you inquired about the recording and slides of today's event. The materials will be posted to the Perfect, Web Perfect Serve website tomorrow and watch for a link in your inbox as well. Before we wrap up today, I wanted to share some additional resources with you. All the webinars in our Thought Leadership webinar series are on the Perfect Serve website, so if you enjoyed today's event, you may consider listening to others. Also, as I mentioned, Doug is on the board for the National Patient Safety Foundation, and their website is full of resources for healthcare professionals as well. Doug, I want to thank you for a great webinar and being our guest expert today. You shared a lot of great information. And then for the audience today, we want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us and work on solving some of these fundamental issues in healthcare. Have a great afternoon, and we appreciate your attendance.